We should live now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and a warm welcome to all people uh, that are in presence and also that are following us on YouTube in distance. Um, we are presenting here um, uh, at, uh, at the DICAR, at, at the Aula Magna uh, of the Department uh, of Civil of, of Civil Environmental Engineering and Architecture of the University of Cagliari at uh, Aula Magna. And uh, I'm ex extremely happy to introduce the, the second keynote le lecturer of uh, ICSA 2021, uh, uh, directed by uh, Professor Sumilal, professor at the University of Florida and director of, of the Mo Mobile and Privacy Computing Laboratory. He will speak today about uh, the digital health back to the future and uh, its lecture will be moderated by Professor Osvaldo Germa Gervasi, General Chair of uh, ICSA 2021, and by myself from, from Cagliari University. First of all, uh, uh, let me do a short introduction uh, of uh, Professor Sumilal. He is a computer informa information science engineering professor uh, at the University of Florida, and, and um, he uh, directs its mobile and privacy computing laboratory. He co-founded and directs the Gator Tech Smart House, a real-world deployment project that aims at identifying key barriers and the opportunities to make the smart home concept a commonplace. In a nutshell, he created the smart home in a, in a box. The active area of research focuses on architectural programmability as aspect of smart spaces and the Internet of Things and on pervasive, ubiquitous systems and their human-centric applications, with special focus on proactive health, patient empowerment and e-coaching, and also assisting technology in support of privacy health, hedging, disabilities, and the independence. He, he, he is also he was professor and chair in digital health in Lancaster University, where he led inter interdisciplinary research initiatives in uh, digital health, in both the School of Computing and Communications, in uh, and also under the division of health research in two uh, faculties, the faculties of science and technology and also the faculty of health and medicine. As director of, of uh, Lancaster Universities, he uh, led several projects on uh, connected health cities, healthy uh, health new town design and implementation, suicide prevention using cybernetics and analytics, and uh, um, intelligent primary care GP patients interactions. Professor Elal served as uh, uh, the editor in chef of IEEE Compu Computer. Uh, uh, it is the Computer Society's flagship and premier publications. He also served as a member of the board uh, of governors of uh, the IEEE Computer Society and the chair of its magazine operational committee. He is a fellow of different associations, uh, IEEE, IAT, uh, AAAS, and, and since July 2020, he is a member of Academia Europea. The title of the, of the lecturer is... Uh, One second. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is uh, um, the digital health back to the future? And uh, with the, its uh, le lecturer, we, we will try to answer the following question. The first one is, uh, it's possible to transform the current fragmented and reactive primary care system into an integrated and proactive health management system. The second one, what are the key advances achieved, but also what are the mistakes in the, in the past 20 years to enable digital health? And the third one, what are the challenges and the potential future path that we should expect in the future in the field of health? Before leaving the floor to Professor Sumi Halal, I have an important remember, please write your question, comments about, uh, about uh, 
the, the keynote speech uh, via you, the chat of YouTube. Now I will give the, the floor to Professor Sumialal. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Chiara, uh, Evan, Osvaldo, and also our friend Bob Abduan from Japan for inviting me uh, to EXA 2021. I'm very delighted to be here uh, in this uh, university and also in this beautiful city. Um, we can start the presentation. Um, the goal for me today is to give a keynote that try to show the opportunities for computational science in a very emerging area of digital health. Um, back to the future means uh, going back first to learn our mistakes so that we can prepare for the future, uh, the future of health. I am affiliated with Florida, as Chiari said, uh, but also in Lancaster. I'm, uh, I was a chair in digital health. Now I'm a visiting professor in, in Lancaster. So I consider myself in both places. But I'm enjoying the sun in Florida, that's for sure. <laughs> Please. So um, uh, we'll go over the agenda item today, um, clicking one item at a time. We'll be uh, uh, just say, what is digital world, be uh, digital health? Because it's just a loaded term. So I will go over this. Then um, we'll go to uh, look at key goals of digital health and then evidence that digital health actually works wonderfully. Just a little digital health makes a big difference. And then we'll look back at the uh, 20 year of research we have done in this area, not just ourselves, but other people and uh, find out what lessons do we learn before we move on to uh, setting an agenda. Uh, for uh, future work, and I will try to emphasize particularly thing that has to do with computational science opportunities. That would relate more to the conference, and uh, hopefully that, that will make the talk more relevant to you. And then we end up with a conclusion. So we start with defining what is digital health. Uh, it's the use of technology, basically, to implement and support uh, things such as personal health, meaning get, getting people to uh, to have a technology presence with them, similar to the GPS. You have the GPS in your car and uh, you rely on it, you trust it, you trust it blindly. If the GPS say, turn left and there's a wall, you will still turn left because you trust it. So can we create something like this, a, a health navigator, so we can all trust it and we live healthier? That's called personal health. We need to find that navigator. Uh, also, active and healthy living and aging, not just living uh, our youth years, but also aging and age gracefully and wonderfully uh, and graduate from this life also with dignity and, and smoothly. So active, healthy uh, living and aging is another uh, 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 sort of thing we mean by digital health. Finally, we need to enable what's called uh, in, uh, learning health systems, learning health systems. These are health systems that, in their complexities, they act as a simple AI algorithm. Of course, it's a big difference. AI algorithm, you can clearly define it, and you can uh, uh, train it, and you can clearly analyze it. But taking several hospitals, let's say all hospitals in Italy, um, with government relevance, and try to consider them to be an algorithm and try to learn uh, to improve, this is not easy, but this area is shaping up. It's called learning health systems. Amazing area to find out better and discover more diseases and find out better about diseases and also find out how to operate better. At the very end, the goal is health outcomes. Uh, health outcome is defined by multiple things. Um, the World Health Organization it looks at the life expectancy. How long do you live? That's one, but of course, uh, people know that that's not enough. It is uh, how much quality of life you lived in the years you lived, not just how many years you lived. So quality of life become an extremely important factor. There is research already for pe people convoluting uh, life expectancy, convoluted over quality of life, and that gave you a much better index. Um, okay, so um, let's look at the aims of digital health. The aim is to transform uh, health uh, or actually the current system, which is not really healthcare system, it's disease care system, uh, just to say the truth. Uh, we want to transform that from a point of care system where you live unguided, no health navigation, you just live your life the way you live it, 
and then something happened, you go to the doctor or uh, to the health uh, clinic, and that's a point of care. We need to transform point of care into a continuum of care. Even cars starting 19, starting 2017, even vehicles, cars that you buy, have significant amount of data that the vendor is accumulating from the moment it leaves the, the, the production line to the moment it is uh, salvaged. So even cars have that, but we don't. We have what's called electronic health record, um, but it's very sparse and it doesn't start until maybe, I don't know, uh, when, when a baby starts getting the first vaccination, but a lot of missed data. So we need to have something very powerful that enable continuum of health, data fl flowing off of us, and the data are analyzed using algorithms, therapeutic algorithm, health algorithm. So we need to be continuously cared for so that we avoid these extreme sickness or and chronic conditions and don't have to do that point of care. Croak down, go to the doctor. Live, croak down, go to the doctor. It has proven to be extremely expensive. $3.7 trillion is the cost of healthcare in America in 2019. We are unable to calculate 20 and 21 because of COVID. It's very confusing. 3.7 trillion is too much. So moving from point of care to to continuum of care, getting the data, uh, get the data to be used by people, government, and everybody else. Okay, so what really determines our health? Uh, many things, but may, some of you may be surprised that the, 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 the healthcare system itself is responsible only for 11% of our health outcome. Only 11% is medical care. The environment we live in is 7%. Genetics is 22%. You cannot do too much about genetics. But look at the right-hand side. Individual behavior, 36%. Social circumstances, how you live in a community is 24%. Collectively, almost 60%. We can do a click. Showing here the digital health opportunity. One more click to show you. This is the low-hanging fruit. is individual behavior and social circumstances. If we can apply digital health in these two areas, we can determine up to 60% of our health. Low-hanging fruit. Thank you. So um, what is the first goal? The first goal is to change people's behavior, to be able to, and to make it um, a desired thing, not make it something that people are uh, afraid of or disliking, that you're already losing the goal from the start. So we need to change individual behavior, uh, population lifestyle uh, into an active. Any way technology can help to get people active is important. Uh, second is we need to transform the care delivery system itself. On the left-hand side, you see the typical ways. You get sick, go to the doctor. We need to change that into these three pictures on the right. The first picture on the top is where doctors stop seeing patients, let's say at 1.30 p.m., and enter into the data room. And there, they treat not a single patient, but let's say 187 patients in northern uh, Cagliari, uh, collectively together combined using their data look at their data cases to treat to look at all these data flying in now we have to utilize all this so treating paper, people through data and their data cases that's one transformation we have to do you have appointments in the morning and then data and algorithm in the afternoon now we're talking also patient engagement is extremely important you want every patient to be involved in their own care so uh, patient engagement means many things i'm not going to dwell into it but finally, the community resiliency. Uh, from the old ages, uh, uh, people used to care for themselves in the form of communities. And that has sort of died down, but now it needs to come back up. And I'll talk about it toward the end of this talk today. So um, successful example of digital health technology in the marketplace. Here you find people just a uh, uh, simple way to get your ECG completely done. When my father passed away, I was running in the town, in the city of Alexandria, Egypt, trying to find a doctor. The doctor came with a big, huge bag that has that ECG machine with all these rolls of paper, and the rolls of paper are messed up. And uh, it was a big ordeal to just get an ECG signal out of, uh, of a patient at that time. Look at it now with a small one inch by two inch device you're getting it. Even your Apple Watch gave you the ECG. These are significant advances. There are signs that we are about to really achieve that health navigator I was talking about. 
but data will fly like crazy. And now we need communities like yourself to make more powerful sense out of the data. Um, certainly the data itself should not be sprung on the face of patient or citizen, because that would be too much. Not everybody is a data scientist. So how we utilize all this data becomes a big challenge. Uh, I want to point to this, uh, if I can go back just to, to, to mark a significant event is that watch on the left-hand side. This is the first watch ever that measure your blood pressure continuously. It has a band and the band will inflate, it will measure, it will tell you. So for all people with, high, with hypertension, this is an absolute lifesaver, especially that the majority of people who get stroke and die uh, because of spike in blood pressure, that happened during the night where they are unable to feel anything. That watch can does it. This is an Omron watch. Um, Eric Topol, you may have heard of him. He writes these controversial books about he wants to change medicine and the uh, way we teach medical school. I interviewed uh, Eric, me and uh, uh, Ramesh Jain. Ramesh is from University of California, Irvine. We kept, we kept sort of pressuring him to tell us uh, in plain terms what he wants to see in medical school and all that. Um, Eric does a lot of uh, data science, computational science, and he, he one of the people who discovered the power of representational learning. Um, representational learning managed to get him to do the study for Apple where uh, it preparation can actually be done using devices that are not accurate, which is the Apple Watch. Apple is a very humble company. They, they suck all our money with expensive devices, that's for sure, but they are very humble. They know and they tell the world what we create is not accurate and we would like to know how to improve. So they had a study with Stanford University uh, and Eric was involved where they put 425,000 people to test the watch to see if they can reliably predict or, or uh, uh, find out people who is atrial fibrillation, fibrillation and uh, they managed to see that they can do that with efficacy of only 33%, but they managed to do the study right. But Eric came up with another follow-up study. He said, well, you don't have to diagnose 100%. The 33% is enough for screening. So you can do screening uh, with, high, with, with acceptable accuracy using noisy and short data. And that's a big sort of finding that would really change many things. Another example is uh, asthma, especially for children. So everybody uh, gets an asthma, then they start sort of uh, uh, using this, the uh, 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 inhaler. But if the doctors know uh, who is inhaling when and create a map similar to the weather map, if the doctors wake up in the morning, let's say in Italy, and they see uh, the map of inhalation overnight, now they have a clear idea what's going on. They have definitive facts they can act upon. So this thing is nothing but a small Bluetooth low energy on the jacket of the inhaler. Go to the phone, go to our registry. Amazing technology with not much, uh, uh, not difficult at all. Not much expenses, please. Uh, this, we can skip this. This is just uh, open notes that made everybody able to see the notes after they visit the doctors. Um, so does it work? So we know a little bit of what digital health is, a bunch of technology in the pathway of, of, of disease treatment and all that. But does it work? This is a study done by Philips Healthcare in England, in Liverpool. Liverpool was chosen because it's a problematic city. Disparity between uh, life expectancy in the same city is 10 year, plus 10 years. From one part of the city to the other, there is a disparity of 10 years of life expectancy. You have range of part of the city you have 79% of that part, 79% of the people have COPD. That's, that's drastic, you know? So uh, how can you manage this? You have almost 80% of the city is sedentary. They are not active. I uh, made a joke once and people didn't like it over there, but it's like they have so beautiful uh, football. They have nice football teams and that's maybe, maybe people sitting down watching football all day. So I was just making that joke at the end. It's a problematic city. Half, over half the city is, is obese, many problems. So Philip said, well, let's put a little bit of digital health and see the effect. The next. So they brought something very trivial, which is a set-up box connected to a TV and has also a bunch of devices connected to it. 
let's stay with that slide to look at the data. Um, they use this for a period of time, over about 5,000 people with COPD, and monitored the uh, metrics. So one metric is paperwork reduced by 60%. Patient face time, seeing patient uh, was increased by 30%. But look at this. You have 35% reduction in hospital admission. 53% reduction in use of ambulance, which is like emergency, creating an emergency situation. And look at the, this drastic uh, statistics, minus 59%. 60% freeing of hospital bed days. The hospital now is, is, is able to handle other diseases and all that. So that was a simple technology. And there are more metrics for the patient themselves with simple technology. So this is not something crazy. It's just taking measurement. And the measurement, by taking them, they go automatically, not even to therapeutic algorithm. They, they go in the back end, as you see these operators. Simple made a significant difference. So that shows you the potential for digital health. So in, in, three, only, in only five years, from 2013 to 2018, uh, the market moved from about 3 billion to 20 billion, or was predicted to reach 20 billion. 2018 came, and we found out it's not 20 billion, looking at the other chart here on the right. It was actually 86, 86 billion. It jumped from 3 billion to 86 billion in five years. And the prediction now is that by 2025, this will go into one half of a trillion market. It's a huge market. And it, 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 it poses a question, what are we doing? We should be the richest of the world. If there is a market that big, academician, researcher working in all this need to be the richest of the world because it's a huge market, right? So I keep telling my, my PhD students this proposition that they have to start up companies, they have to do things because the market really need all this innovation and these are the prediction. So back to the future, let's look at some of the lessons that we learned uh, in the past. I have been working in this area for a while, especially in the context of uh, home health, like smart homes and also health data research. So I'm gonna go back and just uh, stop by a few uh, projects that seem to be relevant to this community and try to point uh, to the opportunity specifically. Yeah. That is a context of several lessons learned and, uh, and it is a smart house known as a Gator Tech Smart House uh, uh, near the University of Florida. It's a normal house. It just uses technology uh, and the technology is inconspicuous, is hidden, and also the interfaces have been, uh, several generation of interfaces with the, with the patient or the resident have been tried over time. Focus was on aging, disabilities, and try to make people live independently. And uh, uh, further context of the smart house is that it was within a retirement community. As you know, Florida is a capital of retirement of the world, or at least uh, Americans like to think that way capital of retirement, so there are a lot of retirement community, and that is the Oak Hammock retirement community. And that is an interdisciplinary team uh, that have worked in, in that project. So the first lesson is, um, we learn is don't, don't over-engineer. The moment you start to see that the, you have a, a nice, beefy engineering problem, the moment you should take a step back and realize this is a mistake. It shouldn't be over-engineered. Just because we are engineers and scientists doesn't mean we have to apply all our tools to create something. That most, most likely means it's complex. If it's so complex, most likely that means there are uncertainties. And uncertainty is just a devil we don't want to live with. So uh, the box principle here is, yeah, you need to think outside the box, but only to put it in a box. So. Um, if we de de define a problem, we ask ourselves, if I explain the problem and the potential solution to a venture capitalist, which is a commercialization boundary, would they understand? Would they have trust in it? If not, it's, it's so far out. Change the way you're thinking. Come closer to the commercialization boundary. Come closer to the box. A avoid anything that cannot be put in a small box and you ship it and sell. It's a funky way of just constraining yourself so that you can accelerate our research translation into 
into impact, into societal impact. That's the first lesson, is don't over-engineer. Remember the box principle. Think outside the box to put it in a box so that commercialization is much faster and so that you can make an impact. Here's an example of uh, a project that was not in the box, which is a smart floor. We created a smart floor in the entire house where we're able to know where the person is, how many steps the person took per day. So a son can get a text at the end of the day saying, your dad is inactive today. He barely did 20% of the step counts he usually does normally in a day. So you can create a lot of applications. So that was fantastic. But look at the wiring and look at the type of floor we have to choose to do all this. This is nuts. So that was um, for publications only. And now we moved on to something better. Next, please. That is something with a little bit of error, but then you compensate again, similar to Eric Topol's principle. Uh, you, you compensate with adding more, more of these sensors. So these are wireless. Um, these are basically accelerometer, high precision acceler accelerometers. And you put them on the wall only. That means you, have, you don't have to create any structure for them. And you do a lot of triangulation, and you do initial scanning and initial triangulation to factor out the noise of the furniture. Because the furniture will create noise in the triangulation algorithm. Find them, learn them, keep them. Now you are able to do more. Uh, we found that we can do the same thing with this. And even more, we can create estimates for how you're walking. Are you perkly walking, or are you barely walking? So that, that, these are two different walks. So uh, again, forcing ourselves to go back to something we can put in a box, which is this, was helpful. Of course, it doesn't come with our challenges because you can see here the hard shoes, the shoes type make a difference. So this, this is data on X, Y, Z for hard shoes. And if we go next, we see data on the soft shoes, um, which are completely different data. So it doesn't come with our challenge, of course, but that's the way it should be. We should think in this area of digital health to focus on, on the box principle. Now, listen to uncertainty. Don't give it a blind eye. Don't ignore it. Uh, don't just get students to put things together, get data, analyze it, by publish paper. Uh, that's fine. That's all should be done. But uh, from, the, from the first moment you get data, you should immediately be suspicious that the data you're getting has all sorts of problems and you have uncertain situation. And I'm just showing you here uh, several sources of, of, of uncertainty in a smart house when you try to collect data. It's a controlled environment, for God's sake, with good reliable sensor to, the, to some extent. But look at this. Collecting the sensor data itself uh, is uncertain. You can actually miss readings. Sens a sensor can actually, even reliable uh, sensors can, uh, can break because these sensors come in contact in what we call it collision with a with a user so the sensor have lifetime we don't understand the lifetime expectancy you buy a computer from dell it tell you the mean time to fail is this but when you buy a small little sensor from honeywell nobody tell you what is the mean time to fail of the sensor it's not uh, it's not an ongoing data that you find in the in the data sheet of these uh, sensors and devices so collecting data is uncertain look at that modeling the model itself you're trying to to create uh, I want to I wanna know if the per person is eating breakfast. The model itself might not be realistic, might not be correct. And then the domain analysis from that you fit your model might not be correct. And then after all this, you have an activity recognition algorithm. The, uh, that algorithm itself may not be accurate, may not be correct. You have tons of uncertainty. So how can you live with all this? So we try to deal with this here before we, we flip the slide. We looked at increasing the semantics uh, of the modeling as a way to, to counter uncertainty. And we found that it works, but also has limit. We um, also re reported that uh, you, you, instead of using data, maybe we should look at a calculus of data, because sensor data is data, raw data coming to you. That's the data domain, D, right? But you could create a calculus of this data, we'll talk about it. And that really sort of tamed down the uncertainty a little bit. This is a huge area, of course. Just uh, imagine smart spaces, sensor data, uh, models, uh, recognizers. And uh, this beautiful community here can do a lot to focus on uncertainty and to try to tame it down, try to 
keep it under control. So here is what one thing we did. Uh, Inju came with my PhD student. She came up with, she challenged the standard activity model. And she said, it's not rich enough. That's why we have uncertainty. So she added more. And uh, the more she adds, the more I, you know, pull my hair because the complexity go high. So you can enrich your semantic models, but then the complexity can come to, to get you. So you have to be very careful. She managed to get by adding operation. Usually you have meta activity, activity and action. She added operation and she added these motion tools, subjects, objects. She added all this. And she came up with a, a beautiful model that was complex, but she m managed to, to tame the complexity itself using fuzzification. So she went into an approach I found very difficult to accept first, but she convinced me, which is, even though you have data, you are worried about the uncertainty from the data. Let's fuzzify the data. She doesn't want to know the truth. She wants to kill the data, the truth itself, from the start. So she, how does she do that? She uses semantical knowledge. So on the bottom here, you see the knowledge. The first knowledge is about the sensor type and the range of value of the sensor and how it's colliding with the user. She used all that information to create fuzzy member function to fuzzify the sensor. She moved that fuzzification, fuzzified sensing for observation forward. And now she used her model. And in her model, you saw, you saw these graphs and I show you more uh, artifacts, but every state in that model has what's so called, um, uh, it has a, a specific semantic, like is it a key state? Is it a unique state? Is it an optional state? Is it a concurrent component? So she started to add these things because these are things that are facts. And try to, try to do activity recognition without, without engaging all this is almost like losing out. So she's like, why do we lose out? We know a little bit about the sensor. Let's put the knowledge of the sensor. We know a little bit about the activity. We know when it's like an activity cannot happen except in the morning or except at night. You know the time. We know is essential or not. Why can't we just incorporate the knowledge. So she managed to incorporate the knowledge back to the chart by creating these fuzzy logic rules, which basically uh, she create implication rules and inference rule, push all that stuff up into that top right box. That is a recognizer. That's her new recognizer. And she indeed managed to, to beautifully reduce uncertainty, meaning reduce, uh, you know, improve accuracy, reduce recall and all that stuff. So that's one way to react to it. This is right in your field is like, how can you do anything at all to get uh, us to be able to create application? Because remember, a programmer does logic that is standard. I say, if this is true, do that. If this is false, don't do that. True and false. Programmers don't know what to do when you tell them. If this is true 82% um, of the time, what does that mean? The, the developer will sort of freeze at that point. Like, well, I don't know what to do. So it is a really important area. And the reason we don't have too many applications and, and actual smart homes is because application always stump over that uncertainty. So that's a beautiful area to work on. Another uh, approach by Raja Bose, one of my PhD students, is to do what's called virtualization. I'll go quickly over it, but it's basically to rely on groups of sensors to create a virtual sensor. Um, and he created also the right virtual sensor, meaning sensors that are totally unrelated to what you're trying to to sense by looking at correlation of data from all sensors, uh, looking at that history, you are able to create virtual derived sensors. So um, um, I will skip this because of the sake of time and move into his second thing, which is phenomena cloud. Uh, we can keep uh, pressing. And now we go to Raja came up with a very interesting idea. The, the problem is this raw data, we're using data we should look at data calculus. So the first calculus he looked at is phenomena cloud. And instead of reading a sensor, read the phenomena cloud. It's much, much more reliable and more predictable. And the error has bounds, beautiful tight bounds, everything you wish. So he defined things to be phenomena cloud whenever possible. And that works beautifully, especially with a replicated sensor. Like in the smart floor, you have pressure sensor everywhere. Perfect, and that's a candidate. For, for phenomena. From that point on, don't read any sensor. Read only phenomena. And he defined phenomena, uh, uh, formalism and model, tracking candidate, potential candidate, and ideal. That's the states of every sensor. 
And uh, you can imagine that there are rules. If we flip the next slide, there are rules for the transition and the protocol, what these sensors should tell each other so that the phenomena shapes up and has a core and it can expand, can shrink, and all this. So uh, if we can uh, flip uh, just a demonstration of how a phenomena actually build up. So by reading a phenomena, you get more confidence embedded in the values of the, of the phenomena. If phenomena happen or not, uh, if it happened, that, that means there is a lot of confidence convoluted from all your neighbors that give you the, the, uh, the more definitive or more or less uh, erroneous reading. He used that, next, he used that simply to redo the walking uh, application in the house, you know, the position and you know, the ca to count, count the steps. He just redid it. And we started to play the de uh, devil and break some sensor and all that stuff. Beautiful. It works. So that's the first lesson we learn is resort to data calculus. If you have uncertain problem in your data, look at higher orders. Don't look at just data, raw data. Look at uh, other things, which I will actually show you some of them in the next slide. Some of them are, uh, here, is, here is, for example, the phenomena cloud which is the one on the right. In the middle layer, the phenomena cloud. But we have also context. We can define a context. Context is a derivative of raw data. Events, very famous. Just forget the data, focus on events. Um, activities, and, but activities build on all this. Uh, behavior, which is more uh, Markovian type of activities over a longer period of time, uh, episodes. So if you, you want to sort of try to resort to this because they built in a lot of semantic richness and that wash away a lot of the uncertainty. Now, this is a loaded area. I mean, I can imagine a whole workshop, maybe conference on this because what we should do at the end is to support multiple simultaneous such, uh, I call them sentience abstractions, sentience abstraction from raw data to other things. These are the things uh, have a meaning to us, but they don't even have to have a meaning to us. If you come up with a mathematical structure that is just a mathematical structure called K, that's fine, so long as it's useful. We need these mathematical structures to be there to tame the uncertainty. So we need to allow for different, for the, uh, uh, for the utility of multiple such sentence abstraction in different application and even the same application. Why? Because again, imagine the future. If you really want to enable the proliferation of a smart space application, like smart home application, developers, that's what you think of, developers, software engineers, they need to have the tools. So you want to give the, the developer the tool to read a sensor, raw data sensor, but read it as a phenomenon, read it as a behavior, read uh, an episode. You want to give them all this based on what they're trying to do in the application, okay? Not one, all of them. So if we go back to the figure, how come from, from the physical world in the bottom here, the beneath, and then you have edge computing coming and getting help from the cloud, how can you do all this? It's almost like a compiler problem when you have to have expression trees and you optimize them. Here you have the same thing. Because if you, if you create mathematical structure separately for every sentence abstraction, you get convoluted, you get bloated. But it starts from, sense, from raw sensor data. How can you create these interrelated mathematical structure that feed into phenomena cloud, that feed into a behavior, and they feed into other? Powerful optimization problem. So that was the second lesson is cope with uncertainty. Third lesson I'll go over quickly, um, and that is invest in platform, think platform. If you have a problem, don't rush into a solution. Invest first in creating a platform. And don't do it yourself. Do it along with other colleagues. So what happened is we, we build a solution, especially in this digital health and smart home and human-centered application in general. We invest 20%. We think we finished the solution only to find it doesn't work. And, uh, and now we have to spend a lot of uh, budget, a lot of money and time to get it to work. And usually it's, it's for time. So we have that 2080 rule. In the smart house, everything was 2080 rule. You think you're done, that's 20% of the effort. Getting it done right is, a, is 80%. So to avoid that 2080 rule, we, you need to create platforms. So next. 
and I need to speed up. Uh, next more. Um, so here's an example of a platform for asthma. So, so, so asthma is a big problem in digital health. It has a lot of devices and it has clinician on the right hand side, devices on the left hand side, middleware people, computer scientists here, try to create the infrastructure and then data scientists uh, in the middle, uh, 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 they're trying to analyze all this. You create a platform so that if somebody invents uh, a device, that device is put in the platform, immediately tested, everything goes for it quickly. And similarly, if you have an algorithm to help asthmatic children, for example, you put it here on the application platform, it's immediately tested. But doing this point solution is very inefficient. You are better off investing first in platform with other colleagues, write, write proposals to create platforms that enable solution to a plethora of problems. Don't write proposal that describe a problem to which you have a solution. That's the traditional way we have been doing. Th this is really more cost effective. Next. Lesson four, uh, make sure it's two-way street, meaning don't, it's not all data science. Uh, it's also how you influence the user. Uh, this is less relevant to this community, but uh, um, I'll just show one, one slide and skip to the rest of the presentation. These are models to, uh, it's called action behavior models to try to do cyber sense, but also cyber influence. And to do that, you have to monitor the mental state of, of, of uh, people, uh, make them aware, uh, enable them to plan uh, and to understand their conditions. And then as they live and act, you monitor. And as you monitor, you realize if they are converging to your persuasion or not. If not, you need to do what's called reinforcement loop, go back to reinforce what you have done. But key here is assess, the last step, is to assess if people are responding to persuasion. That's very difficult and computationally intense. Next. This is a whole structure, how to do assess algorithm. And the leaf is basically, you can see here, behavior, which is more complex than activity, similar to that chart I showed you about activity recognition. So you, you've got a lot of data that is filling in asynchronously and you're trying to find out what is the fastest way, fastest point of time when you say, we assess the person is converging or not. So this area, uh, which is behavior science, you, you should imagine there, there is a need for computational behavior science because behavioral, behavioral scientists are reaching the limit. And at the end, they need structures like this and they need this community to really help them break through. So that work is very loaded and relate to you uh, as a matter of fact. Next, we can uh, skip this slide. Um, Two, two bright uh, uh, master students from uh, University of Bologna came to my uh, to University of Florida and created Cicero, which uh, implement all this uh, assess tree algorithm on a mobile phone. This way, mobile application developer, mobile health, don't have to understand persuasion and empowerment. They just use their, their API. <clears throat> I have eight minutes left. So I will focus on this lesson and I will stop at lesson five. I have other lessons I will not go over. But be prolific. The data you have may say more. Um, I don't know, thank you, more, I don't know. I, I, miss, I, I, I put something wrong here. But the, this, the first bullet is important. Deeper understanding of the health data may yield more data. We always think that if we take data, analyze it carefully, we reach insight. That's correct. But don't, don't skip. There is one more thing you can gain. By looking too much and gawking at that data and analyzing it, you can generate more data. Don't miss that step. Yeah, we need the insight for sure. But data is facts and it's very important. So data can proliferate into more data. That's very critical principle. And the example I'm giving here is compressive population health. <clears throat> uh, the idea here is that to do population health is very expensive. And, and, and very time consuming. It takes time to find, for example, the, uh, uh, in a whole country where certain disease prevalence is, what is the disease prevalence is for multiple diseases and keep it over a year, uh, over 10 years or 15, 20 years. That informed policy informed many things. So it's drastically expensive. So we need to reduce cost, overcome another problem, which is missing record. It's full of missing record and also increase the, re the resolution and coverage. If we're able to do this in an effective way, then we improve health outcome. So 
compressor population health uh, is, a, is, is, a, is an approach that we started in Lancaster, where you start with a traditional population health data set. Look at the prevalence data of multiple diseases and all that. Um, such data sets are very sparse and also have tons of missing data. So what do we explore is we look at the data to see the intra-disease and inter-disease correlation. So it's a correlation game. And then you have spatial correlations. You have also temporal correlation. I didn't write it here. And then you have combination of these correlations. And if you do that and really use a correlation um, to, to infer under bounded errors the areas that are not covered, the, as if you have invented the high-definition TV. We had TV, high-definition TV. You have population health map, high-resolution population health map, all of a sudden. And so my, the lesson here is don't mess on proliferating your data properly, because that really means a lot. And there is also another uh, beautiful way to, to verify further you're doing the right thing by doing what's called spatial shifting. Meaning if you predict, so you have the actual sparse data and now you are inferring the rest. In the next round where you actually do the expensive collection of data, don't do it in the same spots. Shift the grid. If you shift the grid and now you are doing collection of data in, in, a, in an area that you have inferred, now you are able to see the error, the actual error. And now you are able to do to play predictor corrector. Simple numerical algorithm really help a lot. So I will move quicker now. So this is an example of uh, uh, um, not having enough time here, but this is a data set that you, uh, if I can point, how do I point here? Um, yeah, let's stay with that slide. Pick the mouse. Yes, that's a great, great, great advice. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, if we can go back up one, one slide. Here you go. Yeah, so, so this is the data set we extract based on disease. So this is obesity and this is diabetes. And these are the actual uh, traditionally sensed area. TSA means traditionally sensed area. And then we take it and explore intra-disease uh, intra and inter-disease correlation. And now we have these yellow. These are inferred for obesity. obesity. And the same here. The green is inferred for um, uh, um, uh, for diabetes. So you are actually creating more data for yourself. Next. So the, the, the two step is to extract these correlations and then to calculate the error. So extracting the correlation, we do it using um, uh, prevalence inference, using tensor decomposition-based model and deep learning. Um, and then you basically do a multi-objective optimized traditional sensing area to, when, when you start with a traditional sense area, you wanna start with a minimum set. So which one you select? We try to optimize here so that what we select will produce less error. I think I shouldn't dwell more on this. We can just go right to some of the results. This is the name of the diseases, is not important. And this area is around London. Um, and here's some of, some of the uh, uh, results here, spatial correlation does exist, exist. here are some diseases. This is, a, uh, uh, this is cardio, uh, cardio health and this is epilepsy, for example. You can see here within 10 years, uh, well, sorry, within 10 kilometer, this is spatial correlation. Within 10 kilometer, they have high correlation, but the correlation drops as you move forward. Um, that is not generally the, uh, over all diseases, but you, you're getting this done using even different method you see, you see consistency. There is a special correlation, but after let's say 50 kilometer, that drops and things become noise, as you can see at the end of the of the chart. Next, please. Here is a temporal correlation, meaning over the 10 years period of the data set, you try to find correlations. So of course, the center is highly correlated. The dense color is correlated, and in general, also all diseases correlate. There, there is correlation that exists, uh, but it fades over time. Uh, C COPD, which is a top chart, you can see smoother correlation uh, uh, in adjacent years, but it's not for everything. Obesity, for example, is jumpy, it's abrupt. So it's not all diseases have that correlation. And the reason is phase, food phase and, and, and the way people eat, lifestyle changes create these obesity triggers. Next. Um, 
I think I can, uh, can say something here and stop, which is it doesn't have to be very complicated, very simple. And don't forget the simple human factor, which is uh, what Uber taught us. Uber came and solved a huge problem by just employing humans as drivers. So passenger now use driver, human, human. So we don't want to forget the service science behind digital health. So I call for what's called Uberizing Connected Health or Digital Health because it can actually help. Uh, we can jump to the conclusion. This is my team in Lancaster, and uh, I'm grateful to them. The conclusion here is that the future of health is an emerging and powerful force of change. Powerful force of change. It has to be. You're talking about trillions of dollars, talking about money that doesn't is not available, but we keep spending it. Talking about a lot of people dying. One out of three people will die from cancer. I'm sorry, will be diagnosed with cancer. It's drastic. We have to solve it. Digital health is a broad area needed of numerous communities to engage. And your community definitely is in trouble. So I hope that uh, you, uh, my message to you resonates. And I hope you find interest in this area as you define your research projects in the future. Thank you. Fortunately, there are no questions at the moment from from YouTube. Um, thank you so much, Professor Asumi, for your inspiring presentation. Very, very cool. Um, uh, in your vision, I, I guess what you uh, clearly uh, illustrated is th is that we are we are at the at the beginning, pro probably, of a new era where uh, technology. Uh, can impact the behavior of people, can impact on the finance of the government, because of, of course, if, if your inspiring vision become a reality, also government can be able to save money because preventing disease will be much more efficient than <laughs> intervene after the disease has diffused in the population. So, of course, there are very, very um, promising fields. My question is, which is the real, in your experience, the, the real uh, difficulty that make this still like a dream, not, not uh, a so mm, available reality for everyday life? It's a matter of uh, economical, that uh, some companies do not understand the potential that is behind this new field is something related to politics because they do not see an immediate advantage on applying a, a given strategy uh, or is a matter of technology that we do not have still an efficient technology that make this really available thank you for a beautiful question this is a great vision but then why what is the hold why are we not progressing what is the most hindering elements here beautiful question um, there are many panels that address this. One of them is the dis discrepancy between technology and understanding and trusting technology. Technology, we have. Does everybody trust technology? No. Even medical doctors, when we tell them about smart hospital and algorithm, uh, AI algorithm, they're not sure. That's why we started to go into explainable AI, responsible AI. We started to do that. So the one thing is to have a technology, the other is understanding it and also trusting it. There's a disparity between these two. You notice all these devices that come has to go through what's called uh, approval. Actually, it's more of a clearing process, not approval process. FDA, for example, has to approve a device. That watch uh, that I showed you that does a blood pressure, this is a breakthrough. We never ever had a watch that continues to do this. It had to go through hoops until it is cleared. So clearance means what? It means that an organization, the government feels okay about it. But also, you help reduce uncertainty in the data. That's again, the utility of the data. It's all about that the technology is useful. It's useful if we reduce its rough edges. One of the roughest edges is its inconsistency, its, its, its uncertainty. So managing our certainty is very important because it leads into approval process and then the approval process can be cleared uh, if we know, if we do our homework. So it's not about just creating technology, it's about 
reducing its rough edges to a greatest extent. Uh, AI and, and, and is helping, data science is helping, uh, explainable AI is helping, uh, uncertainty, coping with uncertainty is helping, all this. So it's all about trust. At the end, if I have to answer uh, Osvaldo's question, what is hindering us is just uh, increasing the trust. We need to increase trust in the technology, and then everything would be fine. So, sorry for the long answer. No, no, no. Thank you so much for uh, your presentation. Really, really interesting. And uh, uh, maybe if you have any question, maybe in a, uh, not not now because uh, because we have to to start the, the other uh, the other session. Thank you so much, but Professor. professor uh, will last for a couple of other days, so we have chan chance to chat. Absolutely. Of course. Chat uh, with the people from President. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we will uh, see in another uh, in another parallel session and uh, just a little break uh, for all of you thank you